Colossians, chapter number one, the book of Colossians, chapter one. Colossae is a little town not far from Laodicea. If you go to Colossae today, all you'll find is a hill and some ruins. There's no church there, but 2,000 years ago, there was a powerful, vibrant church that the apostle wrote this letter to that had some faithful members. But when he wrote the book of Colossians, it stands in as separate from so many of the New Testament books in the sense that there's no other book in the New Testament that exalts the Lord Jesus Christ more than the book of Colossians. It's a powerful book. So the apostle says in Colossians chapter number 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae, grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, where have you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come to you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit, as it doth also in you, since the day you heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. As you also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. Father, bless your word now. And bless it to the hearing of the people. In Jesus' name, amen. We have every reason to believe the Apostle Paul did not go to Colossae. He did not establish this church. The Apostle Paul was a church builder, believe me. He went from one place to the next establishing the church. But what we have here in verse number 7 tells us that Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, a faithful minister of Christ, Epaphras had a direct hand in establishing this church, the church at Colossae. He's a church builder, a church establisher. That's one of the greatest ministries there is, folks, is to go out and start a church where there is no work, not build on another man's foundation. The Apostle Paul warned them plainly, we don't build on another man's foundation. We don't go take his members from him and build our church. That's not the way you do it. You go where Christ is not preached. You go in an area where you need to, to get the word of God out. And there, start a church. Start one. Build it. You wouldn't believe how many areas in this country, folks, have no churches. These folks are coming here to Temple Baptist Church from all over the country because there's no churches where they live. And the church needs to be established. A preacher called by the grace of God to preach his word goes out and he rents a storefront or he, he uses his house or something like that and he starts a church. That's a wonderful ministry. That's a wonderful ministry. Somebody said one time that most of the preachers in the country are in Florida. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> nice and warm down there, you know. That's just a joke, folks. You can laugh. <laughs> down in Florida. But the truth of the matter is, so many preachers have the idea that they, their ministry is limited to what goes on inside a building. And this building is simply a place where we study and we pray and we fellowship and we prepare to go out and carry the word of God and carry it out to those who need to hear it. So Epaphras, Epaphras is the one along with another who started this church at Colossae. And it's a wonderful thing too. Here's the things I want you to see about it tonight. I want you to notice that the book of Colossians gives you the identity of Christ. Verse number 15, he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Verse 17, he is before all things and by him all things consist. Verse 18, he's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Then in chapter number two and verse number three, the scripture says, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now remember, the apostle is identifying Christ to the church at Colossae. Verse nine, chapter two, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Then in chapter number three and verse number four, when Christ who is our life 
shall appear. Then shall ye also appear with him in glory. This is akin to what the Apostle John says in 1 John 3 when he says, It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, when he comes, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And so the Apostle Paul said it in a different way, but he said the same thing. He said, Christ is our life. In other words, that's who we are. That's where we are. The Bible said, my life is hid with Christ in God. Hallelujah. We're already seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You say, how can you be here and there at the same time? You please give me tonight. The, you, you tell me what the, the, the essence of a spirit is, and I'll tell you how that you can be there and here at the same time. You can't. Nobody can. Nobody's ever bothered to try to tell me what the essence of a spirit is. Do you know why? You're smart. Because nobody knows. Because to break down the essence of a spirit is to break down the essence of Almighty God. For he is pure spirit being. John chapter number 4, the Lord said to the woman of Samaria, God is a spirit. So being born again, I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. My fellowship or my, my conversation is in heavenly places. And my life is hid with Christ in God. And Christ is my life. Therefore, there is absolutely nothing on this earth that sustains my life. The only thing that, that is sustained on this earth is the flesh. And from the earth it came and to the earth it shall return. But the life that is in me is from above. And it's the life of God himself. Now that's what the Bible identifies Christ as. And then it tells you what he's done. Colossians chapter number 1 and verse 13 said, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son? I wish I could get every drug addict in the country to understand that they don't have to give up hope, that they can be delivered from that horrible addiction to drugs. There is deliverance in the name of Jesus. Now, most of the Baptists kicked me out of their churches for saying that, but I'm going to tell you something. There's power in that name. And the name of Jesus, you can be delivered. There's nothing. There is no sin, no bondage, nothing that the power of Christ cannot break. So the Bible said he delivered us. Look at verse number 16. The Bible said, for by him were all things created. He's the creator. Notice carefully in verse number 17. And then, no, I'm, jumped ahead. I'm going back again. Verse 20. Look at verse number 20. Here's what he has done. And having made peace through the blood of his cross. Now I want you to notice what goes on here. We, he has made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. So the Bible says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. God has given forth an olive branch to a guilty sinner and said, I have offered you complete forgiveness and salvation. Just accept it. That's what this is about. And he was in Christ reconciling the elect unto himself. Amen? No, that's not what the Bible says. What does it say? God was in Christ reconciling the Baptist unto himself. No, the world. Every living, breathing human being on the face of this earth, he was in Christ reconciling them unto himself. Aren't you glad for that? You'd be surprised, folks, how some churches will exclude you You'll be surprised at how some, there, there are churches that meet in this town right now that you will never be invited to. And unless you are born into those churches, you will never go to those churches. How many of you knew that? Now, what kind of an outfit is that? Think about that for a moment. Meditate on that for a moment. Let that sink in for a moment. There are those who separate themselves, like the Amish, and others like that. I can respect a lot of things that they do, but have you ever had an Amish man hand you a tract? Have you ever had one try to witness to you to get you saved? You see what I'm saying? 
It is, the, it is the responsibility and privilege of the church of God to get his word out and to witness to men and women, whoever they are. So the Bible says he hath made peace. Look at verse 21. And you that sometimes alienated enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. Two times in two verses, be reconciled. Now what is a reconciliation? Have you ever fallen out with a good friend? Have you ever had words of, of, you know, that you felt bad about later, regretted saying them? And then you felt awful bad about it, and then I don't know which one initiated it, but one or the other, maybe both of you at the same time, said, I don't like this. We've been friends all of our life. i got to do something about this. Let's, let's, as the old saying is, bury the hatchet, and let's be friends again. That's reconciliation. That's bringing back together again. Two that had been together before. He hath reconciled at the cross of Christ. There's a message there going forth to the world. Then the Bible says in chapter number 2 and verse number 11, this is what he's done. Now this is what he's done. In whom also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. This is a spiritual circumcision that cuts the soul free from the body, and none of the Old Testament saints had that happen, and this circumcision allows your soul to be free from the bondage of the body and the death of the body, and being set free from it, then you are able by the grace of God for the Holy Spirit to energize your spirit and give you the victory that only comes from the Spirit of God. And thanks be unto God, this is what he's done. Chapter number 2 and verse number 13, And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, that means made alive, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances against, you, against us, which was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. This is what he's done. Now here's what we are to do. Go back to chapter number 1 and verse number 12. Giving thanks unto the Father. That will tell you more about yourself than anything else I can think of. You can be so theologically correct. You can be so straight-laced. It ain't funny. <laughs> but you don't have any thankfulness in your heart. And if you don't have thankfulness in your heart, you're not right with God. I'm not saying you're not saved, and I'm not saying you won't go to heaven, but I'm saying you cannot walk in the Spirit, you can't have the power of God in your life, and you can't walk in fellowship with the Lord. You've got to be able to be thankful. Unthankful characterizes this generation. The opposite of an entitlement. People feel like they're entitled. They're entitled. The only thing I was entitled for was hell. Then God saved me. And man was, am I thankful? I am so thankful. I am so thankful. I looked at this lady today on the, on the news media, and she had her babies around her and had her husband, and she was weeping. Her house had been burned to the ground. And she said, I'm going to tell you something we can build again. But she said, I've got my family. I am so thankful. That's when you realize we're value. That's where your priorities come in. That's when you understand what means something. She said she's thankful. Chapter number 2 and verse number 6. Here's what we are to do. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk ye in him. Notice that walk. See that? That's a progressive thing. Continuous thing. A continuing thing. Walk in the Lord. If you walk in the light, John says in 1 John, as he is in the light, you have koinonia with each other, fellowship with each other. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, is cleansing you from all sin. Cleanses a continuous, progressive thing. Walking in fellowship means that you're being cleansed of your sins. Hallelujah. I mean, what more could you ask for than that? Walk. The Bible said, to, when the Lord spoke to Abram, he said, in Genesis, I think it's uh, 14, 15, somewhere in there. He said, Abraham, walk before me and be thou Perfect. The word perfect there doesn't mean sinless. Nowhere in the Bible does it say any man's ever sinless, but the one was sinless, the Lord Jesus. He was sinless, 
all the rest of us got a problem with sin. And the Lord said to Abraham, he said, walk before me and be thou perfect. What's that mean? Mature and complete. And the only way a man will ever be mature and complete is to get a hold of God and find out who he is. He wants to walk with you. He sought Adam in the cool of the day. There's nothing greater on this earth than to walk with the Lord. I encourage you. If you're not walking with him, start walking with him again. So the apostle told the church at Colossae, walk with him. Chapter number 3 and verses 1 and 2. This is what we are to do. Now look at this. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. If you then be risen with Christ, if you are going to be raised with him, or if you then be. Which one have we got here? This is an accomplished thing. See? If ye then be risen, you've already been raised with him. See? <coughs> Seek those things which are above. Chapter number 3, verse 2. Set your affection on things above. So the apostle says to seek and to set. That's what he wants you to do. Seek that which is above and set your affections on things above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. In other words, get yourself in a situation where that's what you're thinking about a lot of the time. It's what's going on in heaven. That's where we're headed, you know. Don't want it to be too, 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 too big a shock for you when you cross over to the other side. Surely you won't wake up one day and say, where am I? Surely you know where you're going. <laughs> Amen. The apostle said to be absent from the body is to be buried in the ground, right? No. Be present with the Lord. <laughs> Look at chapter number 3 and verse number 5. Look at this word now. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. What's that? That's the body. You see? Put it to death. He didn't say put your spirit to death. He didn't say put your soul to death. But he said put your body to death. In other words, the fleshly nature mortify it. Well, he, why didn't he say clean it up? Why didn't he say purify it? Why didn't he say kind of get it in line? No, 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 no. The only thing you can do with the flesh is do away with it. That's right. Bring it into subjection. I mean, it's a separate study entirely when it comes to flesh. What's that for? There is no good thing in my flesh. That includes my fleshly brain. Amen. I don't know about you, but I got a problem with my flesh, fleshly brain. Bothers me. <laughs> yeah, it does. Bothers me. You say, when the preacher, I've passed that point. I've been sanctified for 35 years. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> I'll get around to you. Well, maybe rub off on me. I need something. All right. Ch chapter number three and verse number eight. The Bible says, now ye also put off all these. Look at verse number nine. Chapter, uh, chapter number eight and verse chapter number three and verse twelve. Put on, in chapter number three, per, verse nine. Put off, chapter number twelve. Put on. Take something off. Put something on. And what follows is the list of all that goes along with putting off, and what follows is what comes with putting on. But here's where the key is to all of this. It is the thinking of the mind. Your greatest battle will be fought right here, folks, in the mind. And it is the mind that must be renewed. That's right. What does that imply? It implies the fact that you must constantly guard your mind. You've got to deal with that mind. The mind must be renewed. How do you renew it? Read the Bible. Pray. Seek the face of God. Set your affections on things above. See, not on things on the earth. Think about the Lord. Talk to the Lord. Uh, listen to good Christian music, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Get your mind involved with spiritual, eternal, holy things, and that will help set you apart. Keep your mind constantly engaged with that. And I know you got to work. I know your hands are involved in, uh, in doing things. You know, some, I was reading the other day about some of the old carpenters and mechanics and and uh, bricklayers and, and people in the, and, and working in, the, in various jobs, how they make up songs when they'd be hammering a board. They'd be singing a song as they hammered the nails, crossing Jordan or something like that, you know. And they fill their days doing their work, but everything they did, they associated it with the Lord. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. You know that? Say, so, well, you can't do that today. Try it and you'll see. You might be surprised. 
and what you can do. Put off and put on. Now, he gives you two warnings, and I'll close with these. Two strong warnings in the book of Colossians. Very strong and powerful. Chapter number 2 and verse number 8. Colossians 2, 8. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy. That word means phileo and sophist means a lover of wisdom. But a philosophy major today is anything but wisdom. <laughs> because it's the wisdom of this world. So he said, beware of philosophy, vain deceit after the tradition of men and the rudiments of the world, not after Christ. So in plainer words, be very careful with the super intellectual elite that appealed to your ego and because you can understand them and appreciate them, you're smarter than the rest of the people. That's the idea. Beware of that crowd that flatters you about how smart you are. You know, you understand the depths of the spiritual truths that the crowd and the mob could never get a hold of, but you can understand it. So you, you know, you're, you're, you're so blessed. Beware of that crowd. Do you understand that you can read the Bible through intellectually but you'll never, you'll never understand the spiritual truths of it till the Holy Ghost makes it real to you? For the Bible says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. And therefore, it's this simple. If you're not born again, you can never receive it. You know? I marvel at these documentaries and they get this professor from some theological seminary, this woman from the Bible college, and they're all liberals. And when they start quoting the Bible, they start talking about these stories in the Bible, it's as if they were talking about something they read in, in, in some, just some secular book or magazine. Because there's no soul in it. There's no heart in it. And here's the second warning. This is a powerful warning. Chapter number 2 and verse 18. Let no man beguile you. You remember what the Bible says the serpent did to Eve? He beguiled her. Let no man beguile beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he doesn't understand, puffed up by his, by, his, by, his, by his earthly mind or his fleshly mind. They say that Colossae had a cult of angel worship located there. That's what they say. International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, Isby we call it that they had a cult of angel worship and they had a specific cult there that worshiped Michael, the archangel, Michael. So the apostle is addressing angel worship here in chapter number two, remember? Angels, worshiping of angels. Boy, if you ever lived in a generation that worshiped angels, you live in one today. Don't worship the creature, worship the creator. As high as any creature could possibly be, and an archangel is up there, it's still a creature. No doubt in my mind. No doubt. If Michael showed up in here tonight, you would be amazed at the glory coming off of that angel. Michael standing here and Gabriel over here, <laughs> the natural inclination would be to do what some of the saints in the Bible did, fall down and worship them. They're so beautiful. They're majestic glory coming out of them. They're still creatures. There's just one Lord God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Worship Him, folks. Worship Him. And there's only one that, all, that knows all who's omniscient, omnipotent. There's only one. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. And they deserve worship. I'm not worshiping an angel. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I may wind up doing what Martin Luther did one time, and he picked up an inkwell and threw it at this thing standing at the end of his bed. It wasn't a devil with pitchfork and horns. It was a beautiful creature standing at the end of his bed, appearing as God. Martin Luther threw an inkwell at him and said, Get out of my house. <laughs> sure did. Who's singing tonight? Y'all singing? I kind of figured you would be since so sitting over there. Y'all come on up.